Well, we have breaking news about defendant Trump at this hour. He appears to have violated the judge's gag order on mentions and attacks of jurors in his case. On Donald Trump's social media website tonight, Donald Trump reposted something posted by the 8 p.m. host on Fox, Jesse Waters. Jesse Waters says they are catching undercover liberal activists lying to the judge in order to get on the Trump jury. And there's Donald Trump himself posting that on social media tonight, posting it for the jurors in his case to see, calling them liberal activists and liars. Donald Trump calling his jurors who have already been seated liars because what Jesse Waters is referring to there are the jurors, the seven who have already been officially seated on that jury. That's who he's referring to. Then he's saying that they have lied their way onto the jury. Donald Trump is endorsing that. Those words are the same as Donald Trump writing them himself. That was Donald Trump's choice to violate his gag order tonight, possibly in the very worst way. In fact, definitely in the worst way he has violated this gag order so far. This is a severe test now of what Judge Juan Marchand is prepared to do with Donald Trump violating the gag order in the worst possible way by attacking, specifically attacking, the seven jurors already seated in this case. Judge Marchand has already tolerated, which is to say not acted yet on, the claims by the district attorney that Donald Trump has violated the gag order in other ways. But this is by far, by far, the most severe way Donald Trump can violate that gag order by going after the jurors in his, ca his case. This is by Donald Trump, by any interpretation, juror intimidation. This is specifically aimed at intimidating the seven people already seated on that jury and anyone else who might be seated on that jury, that when you're seated on Donald Trump's jury, you will be attacked, you will be publicly attacked uh, by Donald Trump and his allies in the news media. This is the challenge that uh, Juan Marchand, Judge Juan Marchand, is going to have to deal with immediately in this case. Uh, he has... Uh, paused the, his timing on hearing the, the question of violations of the gag order already. But this one, with uh, jury selection in process, ready to resume tomorrow morning, this one, uh, it seems impossible to see how the judge can wait on that. We'll discuss that in a moment uh, with Andrew Weissman. It's always important to remember something about Donald Trump and the way he lies, because no one proves just how much Donald Trump lies better than Donald Trump. And he did that again today. And this time he proved that his lawyers are liars, too. Donald Trump has claimed repeatedly that the Manhattan criminal trial that he must now attend has kept him from campaigning for president. His lawyers have falsely represented the same thing publicly. Judge Juan Mershon said at the outset, that there will be no Wednesday session in the criminal trial of Donald Trump. So Donald Trump knew all along there would be no session today. And today, when Donald Trump had no obligation in court anywhere in the country, Donald Trump did absolutely nothing. The crucial Electoral College state of Pennsylvania is only an hour away from Donald Trump's Manhattan apartment at Trump motorcade speed. President Trump, President Biden was campaigning. Once again, today, in Pennsylvania, but Donald Trump did nothing, nothing, no campaigning at all. Maybe Donald Trump spent the day napping in a more comfortable chair than the courtroom chair that he has reportedly managed to doze off in this week. Donald Trump's criminal defense lawyers spent the day pondering once again what a catastrophe it would be if Donald Trump attempted to testify in his own defense. Because today, District Attorney Alvin Bragg and his team of prosecutors in a required filing in the case revealed all of the issues 
that they would use to attack Donald Trump's credibility in cross-examination on the witness stand if Donald Trump testifies. The notice submitted to Judge Michon says, quote, the people hereby disclose a list of all misconduct and criminal acts of the defendant not charged in the indictment, which the people intend to use at trial to impeach the credibility of the defendant. If the defendant chooses to testify, the people intend to inquire regarding the following. The first item on the district attorney's notice was the case won by Attorney General Letitia James against Donald Trump in which Donald Trump is now ordered to pay $354 million judgment. The district attorney described the case this way, quote, defendant repeatedly and persistently falsified business and underlying records, conspired to falsify business records, issued false facts, financial statements, conspired to issue false financial statements, and conspired to commit insurance fraud by fraudulently misstating the value of his assets for economic benefit, including the Trump Tower triplex by overstating its square footage by nearly three times. Now, every member of that Manhattan jury knows either exactly or almost exactly how many square feet their apartment is. None of them could overestimate the size of their Manhattan apartments by three times. No juror with a studio apartment thinks that they live in a three-bedroom apartment. Those facts used against Donald Trump on the witness stand would be devastating. But the district attorney would present more in cross-examining Donald Trump and attacking his credibility. Quote, defendant testified untruthfully under oath when he claimed that his public comments about a judge's law clerk were instead about a witness. Court held as a trier of fact, I find Trump's testimony rings hollow and untrue. Defendant intentionally violated court order by making public attacks on a judge's law clerk despite two prior court orders not to do so. Court fined defendant $10,000. Defendant committed repeated and persistent fraud in the transaction of business by fraudulently misstating the value of his assets. All of that is just from that one case that the attorney general won against Donald Trump. And of course, the attorney intends to use both of the E. Jean Carroll cases against Donald Trump if Donald Trump takes the witness stand. If Donald Trump testifies in the case, the district attorney would refer to the E. Jean Carroll cases in cross-examination this way. Quote, jury awarded E. Jean Carroll $83,300,000 in compensatory and punitive damages for defamatory statements defendant made about her. Defendant sexually abused E. Jean Carroll. Jury awarded the plaintiff $2,020,000 in compensatory and punitive damages on her sexual abuse claim. The district attorney will also use a finding in a lawsuit Donald Trump filed against Hillary Clinton. Quote, court sanctioned the defendant and ordered him to pay $937,989 in fees for filing a frivolous bad faith lawsuit. The court held, quote, he is the mastermind of strategic abuse of the judicial process, and he cannot be seen as a litigant blindly following the advice of a lawyer. The district attorney would also use the criminal conviction of the Trump business, people versus the Trump corporation. Quote, Trump Corporation and Trump Payroll Corp convicted of 17 felony counts of scheme to defraud conspiracy, criminal tax fraud, and falsifying business records in connection with a scheme to pay unreported non-cash compensation to top executives, including Alan Weissenberg. And the district attorney would use another civil case against Donald Trump, won by Attorney General Letitia James. Quote, defendant illegally allowed his 2016 presidential campaign to orchestrate a fundraiser for the Donald J. Trump Foundation, direct distribution of the funds, and use the fundraiser and distribution of the funds to further defendant's political campaign. Court ordered defendant to pay $2 million for breach of fiduciary duty and waste. Defendant stipulated to the dissolution of the Donald J. Trump Foundation to resolve claims by the New York Attorney General to breach of fiduciary duty and waste failure to properly administer charitable assets, improper political activity, unlawful coordination with the Trump political campaign, and repeated and willful self-dealing transactions. Donald Trump's lawyers will surely oppose 
every one of these cases being brought up at trial. Judge Juan Mershon will hold a hearing on this issue after jury selection is complete. That hearing could occur as early as Friday. Donald Trump is by far the stupidest Republican presidential nominee in history, but he thinks, and in many cases he may be right about this, that his voters are stupider than he is. And that's why he complained today about only having 10 preemptory challenges to use against potential jurors in the jury selection process. The Trump defense and the prosecution ha each have already used six of their 10 challenges with seven jurors seated in the case, with an additional five jurors necessary to complete the 12-person jury, plus six alternates yet to be chosen. Today, on social media, Donald Trump said, I thought strikes were supposed to be unlimited when we were picking our jury. I was then told we only had 10, not nearly enough. Donald Trump's lawyers have known or should have known from the day Donald Trump got indicted a year ago that for the crimes he is charged with, every defendant in the state of New York and every prosecutor gets 10 preemptory challenges. 10. If Donald Trump went out on a Fifth Avenue and shot someone and murdered that person, then he would get 20 preemptory challenges for a Class A felony. 20. There is no place in America where any defendant gets an unlimited number of peremptory challenges. That doesn't exist. But Donald Trump believes that his voters are too relentlessly ignorant to know that. The Trump voters who do know that are all of the Trump voters who have been criminally charged for their attack on the Capitol on January 6th. They learned that the hard way. There are places that you would get less than 10 challenges, many places. The state of Arizona, in its infinite wisdom, under the control of the Republican state legislature, is the only state that has decided to give criminal defendants like Donald Trump exactly zero preemptory challenges. Andrew, I want to go straight uh, to this uh, Trump uh, attack on the jurors in his case. Him uh, quoting on social media, they are catching undercover liberal activists lying to the judge in order to get on the Trump jury. Uh, this looks like a very sharp challenge for Judge Mershon and enforcing his gag order about jurors. Yeah, so let me just fill you in on March 26 of this year, Judge Mershon issued an order to the parties and the relevant part, and I'm gonna read it, says the following, quote, that Donald Trump and any party um, are prohibited from doing the following, making or directing others to make public statements about any prospective juror or any juror in this criminal proceeding. So it's very hard to see why Donald Trump isn't really egging on the judge to say, um, I am now in contempt. Uh, you know, for whatever political purposes he may be doing that, he is clearly asking for it. And I think that it is incumbent on the judge to treat him like any other party. Um, it is, as I have said repeatedly, the road to hell to not treat him like everyone else. Um, and it's very hard to see the defense that's going to be made. I would, am not going to be surprised at all if the district attorney revises their pending motion to encompass this. Um, and I think the judge will certainly want to give an opportunity for the defense to be heard. That is required by due process. But I, it's very hard to see why there will not be sanctions uh, for this conduct. So, uh, Adam, the judge already has a motion pending uh, from the district attorney about comments Donald Trump's made about witnesses. Uh, Michael Cohen, witnesses who've been talked about publicly a lot by a lot of people. The judge didn't exactly race uh, to protect Michael Cohen in, in that situation. Jurors are a whole different status in a situation like this. This seems like a matter uh, that Judge Mershon is going to have to deal with in an, on an emergency basis. I think that's right. I think we already saw already in the trial this week him reprimanding President Trump, former President Trump, for talking around in the presence of a juror. He was already holding him to task. I think he will go directly to this and meet out 
a the punishment if necessary. Yeah, and, and Andrew, it, it goes to this question of punishment, and I, I know that all these judges in the back of their minds are, are facing with something like this, and this is the worst one we've seen by far. This is worse than anything we've seen in Washington, D.C. Uh, this is jurors. These are specific seven people that he's talking about lying there. Um, there's the issue of what can you do? Uh, a former president who has Secret Service protection mandated by law, there's nothing anyone can do to remove that Secret Service protection. Joe Biden can't order it away. It's mandated by law. The idea that a, a local judge in Manhattan could uh, send Donald Trump to Rikers Island jail with a, a Secret Service delegation of a couple of dozen uh, 24 hours a day for whatever period of time we're talking about. That would be several shifts of Secret Service agents. Uh, that would require a hearing where the Secret Service is testifying about can they protect him there. They will surely testify that they don't know how to do that, uh, never having done anything like it. I mean, I know that the judge is just envisioning, unlike any other defendant I could be dealing with, Putting this person in jail has logistical and practical challenges that may be beyond their capacities, which then I suppose could open a question like, do you give him home confinement uh, and, as an alternative to that? And, and in that case, make the Secret Service, in effect, be his jailers as well as his protectors. So I hate to sound like a sort of hardened former prosecutor, but that um, plea falls on deaf ears to me. Um, it, there are places in jails that somebody can be kept very safe. Um, and so, you know, put him in a, in a cell with no one else in that cell. Um, there, no one else is going to get to him. You're, if you're concerned about sort of the reason Secret Service is there is so that there isn't some, you know, crazy person who's going to take it upon themselves to take a shot at um, some some public figure or former public figure. And, you know, that is something that is less of a concern in um, various places um, that are in federal and state prisons. Um, there's also ways to put somebody in lockup for a temporary period of time in the courthouse. Um, but that's all, you know, remember the first step, I think, uh, is uh, fines that are one of the mandated mm -hmm. uh, uh, sanctions. And then a second step can be jail up to 30 days for any single violation. If you have multiple violations here, there are already three alleged violations. This would be a fourth. It could be 30 days and 30 days and 30 days and 30 days. I usually don't do math in public, but I think that comes to 120. Um, and you don't have to go to the maximum at first, but you can easily, what is the, in the term of art is step him back. Um, and so he spends some time like a child in time out. Um, Secret Service is something that I think people have put far too much weight on is something that means that somebody just because they have Secret Service protection can't do jail time. In this country, no one is above the law. And if, if it is determined that jail is appropriate, then Secret Service will have to just figure it out as part of the rule of law in this country. Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.